So far we've been talking about a very typical way of sex determination. And we've been assuming that people who carry ovaries are typically women. They do meiosis by which they produce eggs. And people that carry testes are typically men. And they do meiosis in their testes to produce sperm. And then the egg and the sperm combine in fertilization. And that produces a zygote, which is the first cell that will then divide by mitosis to produce an embryo. But there is a lot more variation in reproduction than this in the natural world. We have several species of birds, like the spotted sandpipers, where the males are the ones that take care of the eggs, while the females mate with multiple males. We also have examples where the males are the ones that actually become pregnant, like in seahorses. The males are the ones that uh, grow their young in their bellies and then give birth to live seahorses. And there are also multiple ways in which sex is determined in the natural world. So we have organisms that have both sexes at the same time, like hermaphrodites. They're both male and female either at the same time or throughout their lifetime they might switch back and forth. We have genotypic sex determination, that is when the sex is determined by the chromosomes. And we also have environmental sex determination. This is when the sex is de determined by conditions in the outside environment. It could be social factors or it could be things like temperature. And examples of hermaphrodites are snails and earthworms and tapeworms. This, these are usually organisms that don't move very fast. So they have few chances of running into another organism from their same species. So in order to mate, it's going to be very difficult for them to find not only another organism that is from the same species, but it's also from the opposite sex, if they had to mate with the opposite sex. But if they're hermaphrodites, every time they run into an organism from the same species, they're able to mate, so that makes it very efficient. And we have sequential hermaphrodites. These are the organisms that switch sex throughout their life. So an, ex an example are clownfishes. They start off as a male, when, I mean, first they're juveniles and then they mature as males. And as they get older, they eventually transition into females. We have the opposite example, organisms that start as after a juvenile period, they develop into females. And then as time goes by, and this might be covered by social factors such as the male in the group disappears, then the largest female, the dominant female, might turn into a male. This is something that we see in almost all species of classes. We also have organisms that switch sex back and forth depending on the conditions or their social environment. These are the gobies, for example. They can switch uh, from male to female or female back to male. And in the in-between, for all these sequential hermaphrodites, you will have a time where they're intersex, where they're in-between switch in sex. Like we said earlier, we also have multiple ways of chromosomal sex determination. In humans, females have two chromosomes of the same type, two X chromosomes, while males have an X and a Y. We also see that in fruit flies. In birds, it's the opposite. Females have two different chromosomes, a Z and a W chromosome, while males have two of the same chromosome, two Z chromosomes. In grasshoppers, the females have two sex chromosomes and the males, they're diploid for all the other chromosomes, but for the sex chromosomes, they only have one version of the sex chromosome. And in honeybees, the females are diploid for all their chromosomes and the males are haploid for all their chromosomes. Here we see an example of bees. So the, the queen in the bee colony is the only one that reproduces. This is similar also to ants. The queen bee is diploid. To produce eggs, if those eggs get fertilized by a male, the egg originally had the red chromosomes that came from the female. The male contributed these blue chromosomes. This egg got fertilized and now is giving rise to a diploid organism that will be a female worker. If the eggs do not get fertilized and they start developing without fertilization, this is what is called parthenogenesis, that resulting organism is going to be a male that is haploid. We also have environmental sex determination. This is very common in reptiles, where at a certain point during development, what if the eggs are exposed to cooler or warmer temperatures, the nests are usually buried in the ground and they will have different temperatures for the eggs depending on how deep or shallow they are. 
this will determine what sex the resulting organisms are. And those in the in-between temperatures, in some cases, uh, the females are the ones in the in-between temperatures and low temperatures result in male and high temperatures in males. Sometimes the high temperatures always result in females and the low temperatures in males and then those in between have some sort of intersex. It depends on the species how the temperature determines sex. And we see this in turtles where warmer temperatures in the nest result in females while in alligators, warmer temperatures result in males. And you can think how is climate change going to affect sex determination in these organisms. So I hope I've showed you the wide range of sex determination that it's in nature. We actually see a lot of examples in nature where there is a lot more diversity than that.